wish somebody had talked to me about money when I was growing up. The nearest thing I got to a financial education was that I played Monopoly, from which I knew there were things you wanted and things you needed and a certain amount to spend. I had no chance of winning a beauty contest, but hopefully, as you went round in life, you had enough to do what you wanted when you wanted to, there in the bank, so you wouldn't go to jail. I thought whether you won or lost was just about a roll of the dice. So I had no plan and I always lost because hope is not a strategy. And I wish I'd taught my children more the things that I'd learned that God was teaching me once I became a Christian as I studied the Bible about how to be a good steward because when I began to implement what it says here about wisely using wealth, the situation dramatically improved. First off, my new wife then insisted I underwent painful plastic surgery, cutting up my cards, then we paid off the debts. The debts I'd accrued as a well-paid waster. I had to pay off the past mistakes, live prudently in the present and slowly build for a better, more peaceful future. She's always done a much better job than I have at modelling the principles that have led to true financial freedom, which I now define not as having to do enough to do what I want, but having enough to do what God wants when he wants you to. So many people would love to be more generous, but the way we live means we're not able to give because we want to spend it elsewhere or it's already spent. It's going out as payments from the past. We're raising up young children people who are desperately needing somebody to care enough about them to teach and show them what God says about the dignity of work. For the first instance, which is attached indissolubly to responsibly handing money, including then savings and investments and giving and spending and debt. If not, we send them out into the world with the word sucker written on their head, totally at the mercy of advertisers and algorithms surrounding them and selling to them every waking moment. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 in the Old Testament says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it. That means however the world economy changes, this generation can be better equipped for life and it's never too late. And it's better to learn when I'm six than when I'm 60. The writer of that proverb and many more is somebody we can all learn from because Solomon asked for God's wisdom and implemented it. And when he did, he became the richest and the most generous person in the world of his day. So to teach the kids now, maybe I'd get some envelopes and I'd put some of that uh, Monopoly money in again after playing the game. Remember the game always ends, whether you had more at the end or less, it all goes back in the box. And then I asked them about how, if they worked, they're going to get money, which is a good thing to teach kids that builds confidence rather than just giving pocket money for doing nothing. Then they'd have decisions to make about what to do with what was in their hands. I'd tell them the story of how Solomon had a dream where God invited him to ask for whatever he wanted. And Solomon said that he was like a little child, not knowing what to do, and so he asked for wisdom. Look how God answered that request. It says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth or for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for, both wealth and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. The young king became wise in trading and commerce, as rulers from other nations brought him fabulous gifts and tributes every year. His nation's wealth grew so much under his leadership that silver was thought of as commonplace. And the great news is he's passed on what he knew so you and me and our children, if we have them, can learn it. The book of Proverbs starts, these are the wise sayings of Solomon, David's son, Israel's king, written down so we'll know how to live well and right, to understand what life means and where it's going. 
a manual for living, for learning what's right and just and fair, to teach the inexperienced the ropes and give our young people a grasp on reality. So, to pass on Solomon's wisdom, I'd write give on the first envelope. How much will we give to store up treasure in heaven? See, nobody needs to be taught to be a spender, but we have to be taught that giving to God should be first and foremost in our finances. I don't just mean giving a child some of your pennies to put on the plate. They get no real understanding from that and no spiritual blessing at all because they're just acting as a courier for your loose change. But when they bring back to God something from what he gave them, they start to see that giving is one of the best parts of life. And they start to prove what Jesus said, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So to live it large, we have to grasp the paradox of generosity, a divine principle that challenges the world's logic. Remember, in Proverbs 11, 24 to 25, it was Solomon who observed one person gives freely, yet gains even more, another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So, give. Give first. The principle of putting God first runs all the way through the Bible. And it obviously extends to finances. Solomon says, honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. The barns and vats here equate to your material needs. If we put money first in our lives, it's an idol. But Solomon says, what we need will not only be met, but will be abundantly supplied if and when we honour him. Not by giving leftovers, but bringing our best, the first fruits, for God. And Solomon's own life proved the principle. When he ascended to the throne, he offered a thousand burnt offerings to the Lord. And then it was right after that act of generosity that God appeared to Solomon, made him that life-changing offer that he could now ask for anything he wanted. He gave first, and it really is true, you can't outgive God. The lesson is clear. When we give generously, we position ourselves to receive God's blessings in abundance. Giving first starts the virtuous cycle. There's an old story that says a thirsty traveller going through the desert found a letter tied to an old pump that offered the only hope of, of drinking water on that trail across the Nevada desert. The note said that the pump works fine but the washer dries out so the pump has got to be primed. Under the rock I buried a bottle of water and you, you can use that to prime the pump but not if you drink some first. The well has never run dry, have faith. When you get water up, fill the bottle and put it back like you found it for the next fella. Desert Pete. And then he wrote, P.S. Don't drink the water first. Prime the pump with it, then you'll get all you can hold. So now, the traveller faces a dilemma. He can drink the small amount of water to satisfy his immediate thirst or trust the promise and potentially have all the water he wants if he believes that there's plenty more where that came from. So, what would you do? A widow was faced with a similar dilemma in a time of drought. It says that she and her only son were so impoverished, they were down to a little bit of flour and oil, just enough for their final meal. And then the prophet Elijah turned up in the village and asked her for some bread and water. Now she looks at what she's got from the perspective of what she's not got, and she says, it's not enough. Elijah said these words to her, don't be afraid. First, Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. What's he encouraging her to do? Prime the pump. If she's not afraid but gives first, she's going to see that her flour and oil jug supernaturally remained full until the drought is over. Now she did it. She acted in faith on the promise and she saw the truth that God is always able to provide for us and there's always something that we can share. An organisation called Stewardship just did a very interesting survey that showed on average people in the UK give £65 a month to charity. How much do you think Christians give? £8 a month more. £73, which is 3.2% of income after tax to all causes, including their church. 10% 
even after tax, would have been £232 a month on average. Though the fact is most of the Christian survey didn't know what percentage they gave. They just went off what they felt instead of anything that they'd ever worked out. Now I'm pretty sure if you gave the monopoly money and asked the child how much they'd want to give back to God, who gave it all to them in the first place, many of them would go way higher than 10% that they give back to him. You've probably heard that being called a tithe, and perhaps you feel now you couldn't possibly say you could ever do that, but have you ever worked out what percentage you do give back to God through his church, which is where I believe scripturally the tithe belongs, and after that, as you give generally, what's the percentage? How about starting to break the power of materialism by giving first 1% or 2% or if you tithe already, what's a faith stretch for you? This kind of giving, in a way that seems sacrificial, jars with us, not because we can't, we can't just quite believe that the prophet would ask a widow, widow to give first, but also because we believe we have to hold on to whatever we've got in order to meet our own needs first. Then generosity becomes a matter of convenience, giving what we feel we can when we want to. But as followers of Christ, giving is never meant to be a mere transaction. It's a means of heart transformation. Giving is just as much a spiritual discipline to grow our faith as prayer. I know, looking back at my own experience, that you only really grow in those times when you're stretched beyond your comfort zone. Our hearts are tested when we want to lock up and hold on to whatever we've stored away for security, but instead choose to trust God and release it to do what seems like reckless faith anyway. So, give first. On another envelope, what would I write? I'd write, spend. How are we meant to spend our money? Like, like it belongs to God, like he's entrusted it to us. Spend like a steward. Being a steward simply means one day we'll be called to give an account for how we invested the assets, the time, talents and treasures that we were entrusted with for a time. All Jesus' stories about being a steward end that way with, with an account. And Romans 14, 12 says, one day each of us will give an account to God. And the phrase in the original Greek is used there primarily in re reference to financial matters. So, give first and pray next to spend like a steward, knowing our very generous Heavenly Father is the owner of everything, but he gives everything richly for our enjoyment so we can be grateful and we can be generous. Living like a steward is never meant to feel like an obligation. It's an opportunity. When I realise I'm not the source of my own supply, I'm not independent, but I can depend on God to provide. If I'm always worrying about money and wanting more, that shows who my master is. In Ecclesiastes 5.10, Solomon warned, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income, this too is meaningless. Solomon understood from his own life the dangers of the pursuit of wealth for its own sake and unchecked spending. At this point in his life he'd come to the end of an empty chase of more, 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 which only led to dissatisfaction and a meaningless existence. He was not living large. He said, I piled up silver and gold, loot from kingdom and, and kings, Oh, how I prospered. I left all my predecessors in Jerusalem far behind, left them behind in the dust. Everything I wanted, I took. I never said no to myself. But when I looked, I saw nothing but smoke. Smoke and spitting into the wind. There was nothing to any of it. Nothing. Spending wisely starts with gratitude and leads to contentment, which the Apostle Paul says is the secret of true financial freedom. The way we get there is to make a budget of what we have left after giving back to God. Prioritising our expenditures, distinguishing between needs and wants to avoid the traps of materialism and societal pressures to sacrifice everything to satisfy fleeting desires. Wise, faithful stewards gain and maintain financial health using all our resources to honour God. Not just that percentage we give back to help those in need and further the kingdom. Then on the next one, next envelope, I'd write, save, save wisely. So often our culture convinces us the only way to save money is to buy something on sale. 
I've fallen for that lie so often. I know Solomon would shake his head as he quoted Proverbs 21, 20 to me. Precious treasure remains in the house of the wise, but the fool devours it all. As I write, the average Brit holds about 35,000 pounds in personal debt, but one in three have less than a thousand pounds in savings. People don't tend to just fall into debt or into building up savings either. Decisions lead to destinations. Now you might have noticed there's no debt envelope here. We need to teach this and realize it ourselves. The only good debt is one that I paid off because Proverbs 22, seven says the borrower is slave to the lender. The lender. If you deny you're a slave, just try missing some of those easy payments. That, maybe that's why they call it MasterCard. Saving money isn't hoarding wealth out of greed or fear or the worry that Jesus warns us of in the Beatitude. It's about prudent planning for the future. Some people might say, I don't need to save because I know God's always going to take care of my needs. But the fact is, he is doing. He's doing so right now and he expects us to use what he's giving to us right now wisely and with foresight for both known and unforeseen needs in the future so that we have resources in times of need to not just be able to look in after ourselves but to help other people too. It's not selfish to save. Do you remember how in Genesis, Genesis chapter 41, Joseph encouraged Pharaoh to act in response to his dream of lean times ahead by saving. Saving saved the nation. Don't put saving off until you get more disposable income. Build saving in after giving in your expenditures. So I'd say give first, then save next. Don't just dispose of it all in the spending envelope. The best time to start saving is always now, as you're blessed so you can be a blessing. An ant brain has about 250,000 nerve cells. We have 100 billion of them, but Solomon says we can learn a lot from ants. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at the harvest. You ever seen those ant farms, incredibly intricate, massive cities built by tiny creatures? How do they do it? One grain at a time. That's how we save and get a better future. So as you look at the 100% that God has given you, what do we do? Well, give first. And then before you jump in and spend next, when putting that budget together, pay yourself next by saving. Put a percentage away for that rainy day emergency. Then, once you have that, begin to not only save, but invest. Somewhere the money you work for will start to work for you by earning and compounding interest over time. Now, Jesus said, we should watch out for all kinds of greed, but saving is an act of good stewardship when it reflects our trust in God's provision and commitment to use his gifts wisely rather than squander them foolishly. So, give first, spend like a steward, save wisely and avoid debt. It's not hard to understand. Kids can get it and we should really teach it to them. But we don't always act on what we know, do we? Information without application will never lead to transformation. If it did, we'd all be rich with a six pack. We have all the information. We may have the best of intentions, but coulds and shoulds and oughts don't change anything, even if they make us feel a little bit better, unless we prayerfully make a plan with our spouse, if we have one, and then act on it. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus, Jesus looked at the large crowds that were following him. They just after miracles and free food. They just wanted more and more for themselves. He knew many were just along for the ride and rather than encourage the superficial and selfish, he confronted consumer Christianity, pushing them deliberately in terms of their real commitment to him. We've said that salvation is God's greatest free gift to us, even though it cost him everything, but he wanted everybody to grasp the reality of being a disciple. So he says in graphic terms, we too must carry a cross to follow him. And then he gets down to the practicalities of what that would look like. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everybody who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down 
and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. The key word there is, is not about what the builder wanted or whether he got started, it's what gets finished. And the wise king, notice, sits down to consider and then he takes action. That's what makes the difference. Vague good intentions, hoping something different happens, gets us nowhere. Doing the maths, counting the cost, then following through on a strategy is a vital part of real faith. It determines whether in the end we'll be more like the careless, witless builder or the careful, wise king. Have we really counted the cost of following Jesus? I know I've been talking about money, but it's not your money or your life. He says it's both, it's everything. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You know, people can talk about, we sometimes talk about praying a prayer or giving my life to Jesus, but how can I really say I'm giving him my life, but I'm holding on to the financial parts of it? Money is perhaps the truest test of whether we mean what we say when we pray. Once we've really given our lives to the one who gave it all for us, living to give is easy. In 2 Corinthians 9, the apostle Paul wanted to encourage a church to give, so he told them about another church, a poor church, and he said that these people, nobody could stop them from giving. They didn't have to be told to give, they had struggles of their own, but rather than beg for help, they pleaded to be able to contribute. Then they went over and above what could be reasonably expected. How? What was the secret? The Macedonians gave so freely because they'd given themselves first to the Lord. That's how we live the larger life. To the extent we've really given ourselves, our lives, then giving and sharing material possessions won't be a problem. If at the end of this teaching we just decide to give a bit more money, we're actually missing the point. The larger life is when I centre myself, everything I am, everything I have around Christ and his mission to reach a world that is lost and full of desperate needs. So I prayerfully and gladly give him all I am, my heart with total devotion and commitment, my mind controlled by Christ, my eyes fixed on him, my ears listening to him, my hands open and serving others for him, my feet following his lead, my desires, my energy, my dedication, my choices, my work, my service. And as I realise who he is, how short this life's opportunities are, the opportunities are to invest in that future kingdom and help people right now, I willingly give everything I have to Christ, whatever the cost, putting him first if necessary before family, friends, comforts and rewards. If you really want to live it large, pray now as we give ourselves first to the Lord and surrender everything to Christ, which means whenever the Lord speaks, we're willing to use whatever the Lord gives us for whatever the Lord says he now wants to use it for, for the mission of reaching a lost world that he came to save and for his glory.